2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. You know, the Bible has a great deal to say about time and the fleeting moments of this journey that you and I call life. Now, we all know by nature and by experience, we know the most important truth about our time. Here's the truth we know. We know that our time is limited. Time can be used or time can be wasted. It can be invested or it can be squandered. But, but any way we use it, once we use it, it can never be regained. Time matters because we have such a limited supply of it. I want you to listen this morning. You don't have to turn there. But I want you to listen this morning to one of the most intriguing thoughts concerning time and concerning life as it is recorded in the Word of God. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, the Bible says that there is a time for everything. A season, the Bible says, for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to search and a time to give up. There's a time to keep and there's a time to throw away, a time to uh, tear, and a time to mend. Listen to this. There's a time to be silent, Amen. and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. My grandfather, who was a great man of God, one of the heroes of my life as I was growing up, he has gone to heaven now, but he made this statement to me one time. I, I, I had said something about uh, uh, not having enough time to get by there or to do this or that. And he told me this. He said, Stuart, you have time to do what you want to do. Now, I think he was absolutely correct. And you know the truth is, we have time to do everything we need to do. Now, I'm going I'm to show you what I mean by that, but here's the first money statement this morning. If you're writing that down, here it is. All of my time belongs to God. And therefore, how I spend my days is a sacred issue. Now, I want to repeat that for those of you writing it down. All of my time belongs to God. And therefore, how I spend my days is a sacred issue. You see, there's coming a day when, when I'm going to answer for my actions on January the 9th, 2017, just the day I picked out. I, I'm going to have to give an account for my actions on January the 9th, 1987. Or August the 9th, 1999. Let me bring it a little closer home. I'm going to have to stand before God one day and give an account for May the 7th, 2017. Boy, that brings it a little closer, amen? That's today. Time is important. And time matters because time encompasses our life. You see, when time is gone, life is gone. Time is... Very important. Therefore, what I do with the moments of my life, the opportunities that I take, the path that I walk, all of it matters because sooner or later, for you and for me, time will be no more. Listen, not only are you and I living on borrowed time, but listen to me, you and I are a captive to time. And, and we're more of a captive to time than sometimes we would like to admit. admit. If you don't believe that, when you go to lunch today, I told the early service, then, then just look around at lunch today as you're gathered around the table or you're out in a restaurant. Here's what you'll see. Cell phones, iPhones, iPads, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We don't want to miss anything. 
Matter of fact, sometimes we can't turn it off in service because we don't want to miss anything. Today, listen to this. Today we talk on tools or talk more on tools of mass communication than we do in person. We've learned how to save time by changing the way we communicate with one another. If you're over 60 in here today, over 70 in here today, you remember handwritten letters. If you're between ages of 40 and 60, you may use email a great deal. If you're in a hurry, maybe you're here today and you prefer instant messaging. But if you're, if you're any age in here, I found this out, if you're any age in here today, you love Facebook, amen? Oh, we love uh, uh, Instagram, we love Twitter, we love Snapchat, we love FaceTime. For most of our society, time is the currency of life. And in this generation, time matters to us more than money. Now how do I know that? Listen very carefully. Because we spend money trying to save time. That's how I know it. We spend money trying to save time, whereas the older generation spent time trying to save money. How much time do you, do you think you have left this morning? None, none of us know that. Do you know today could be your last day? Did you know this year could be the last year? Psalm 90 and verse 12, the psalmist says this, Teach us to number our days that, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. How many here this morning have ever numbered your days? Well, well nobody. I, I'm sure none of us have. Because we can't look into the future and see what we have left. But that is just the point. That's just the point the psalmist is making. Hey, numbering our days keeps us from thinking we will live forever and therefore it gives us excuses to put off doing what we know we ought to do. The Bible reminds us in Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 19, Paul writing in another area of Scripture, he, he, he talks about redeeming the time. We're to redeem the time. Another translation puts it this way, make every minute count. When a man knows he's going to die in the morning, it has a wonderful way of centering his mind. Bringing things into focus. Most of us don't think we're going to die tomorrow, and that's why we let time slide through without a thought. But if you knew you were going to die soon, don't you think it would bring life into perspective? I mean, wouldn't it center your mind? That's what happened to the Apostle Paul as he wrote his final letter, letter to his young son in the ministry, Timothy. As we come to the end of chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, we're reading the final recorded words of the Apostle Paul. Shortly after he wrote these last verses, he died. Most people believe that Nero had him beheaded in Rome. I want to pick up reading in verse number 9. Remember Paul speaking to Timothy. Young man who was converted in his ministry, called to be a preacher. Here's what Paul says to Timothy. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he's profitable to me for the ministry. Antichicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith, the, the worker of metal, did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the light. 
And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute Priscilla and Aquila of the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Now here's our verse. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Timothy, come before winter. I want to speak this morning on this subject, living with the end in view. Living with the end in view. What was on the mind of a man who knew when his last breath was just hours away? Paul knew what was coming. He knew he was headed for the chopping block, the guillotine. He knew it was coming. What was on his mind? Well, here's what I find. His last recorded words are mostly about people. Did you get that? Mostly about people. He mentions Demas. Demas was probably a... a uh, a partner of his in the ministry. But the Bible says Demas got his eyes off the Lord basically and Paul says that he left me and, and really just gave in to the world's allurements. It was too much for him. He loved this present world and he left me. He, he talks about other good fit friends, Cretans, Titus, Tychicus, who were serving the Lord in other places. He, he speaks of Luke. Thanks God for Luke, who's remained in Rome to, to give him comfort while he's in prison. He mentions a man by the name of Alexander, the coppersmith, a man who did him great evil, a man who withstood him and, and tried to get the gospel, tried to, to get the preaching of the gospel totally stopped. Then he greets friends in other parts of the world, and he, then he writes to Timothy, giving him greeting from friends in Rome, and then he gives thanks to God for his faithfulness. But above all else, Verse 21, he desired that Timothy come to see him in prison before he died. Now, Timothy is probably in Ephesus, hundreds of miles away from Paul, and it would take several months for him to come to Rome traveling by ship. The aged apostle wanted to see his young son in the ministry one final time before he died. And here's what I want you to get this morning. Listen to the urgency that are in the words of the Apostle Paul. Notice what he says in verse 9. Do your best to come to me quickly. Verse number 11, get Mark and bring him with you. Verse 12, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. Bring my scrolls, especially the par parchments. And then notice verse 21, Timothy, come before winter. Timothy, if you're going to come at all, you need to come now. Timothy, if you're going to come, don't wait, don't delay, don't put it off. I I'm not going to be alive much longer. Come quickly, my friend. Come before winter. I want everybody to listen to me this morning. There are some things that we can't put off. Some things that we can't delay in. For 30 years, Clarence McCartney served as pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Every year, preachers do this. Sometimes I told the staff that uh, there are some sermons that, that preachers preach every year. But every year, he preached a sermon entitled, Come Before Winter. And it was based, obviously, on 2 Timothy 4 and verse 21. And it became one of the most famous sermons of the 20th century. You know what the Apostle Paul did? The Apostle Paul lived his life with the end in view. Now, could I get us this morning to do just that? Could I, could I get us to focus on just a couple of truths this morning, three questions for you and for me to consider today. Number one, here's what I want us to consider. Why come before winter? Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 21, Do thy diligence. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Why? You see, for Timothy and Paul, during the winter, the weather made travel by sea very difficult. Sometimes it made it impossible. If Timothy delayed it all, he would not come to Rome until the spring. 
And if he waited that long, Paul very likely would be dead. So if Timothy was going to come and see Paul, he could not wait. He had to do it then. Friend, could I remind you this morning that there are some things that we must do now. We must come before winter or they will not be done at all. There are doors of opportunity in your life personally. There are doors of opportunity in the life of this church. But if we don't take advantage of them by springtime, those doors may be closed. You cannot wait forever to respond to the things that are important. None of us can. It's expedient in this life that to some issues we must respond now. We must answer now. We must act now. We must not delay or wait. We must not put it off to a more convenient time. Listen, a more convenient time many times is too late. James chapter 4 verse 13 and 14. James says this. Now listen you who say, Today or tomorrow we'll go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. James says, why? Why do you say that? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Friend, that's all we are. We're just a vapor. We're just a mist. We are dust blowing in the wind. We're nothing more than the grass of the field that's here today and it's gone tomorrow. Life changes quickly. Man, you, you can be in here today and you can be calm and peaceful. But by tonight, your life can be shattered. Your dreams broke. Maybe your loved one wakes up one morning with what seems to be a harmless headache. And by lunch, they're dead from an unexpected brain injury. December 22nd, 2005, Tony Dungy, who at that time was the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts, he got the phone call every parent dreads most. His son James, at the age of 18, committed suicide. Now, no matter who you are, some of you have experienced that from a family member, and you could say no matter who you are, you are never, ever ready for that phone call. You're never ready for that. But because he was a Christian with a strong faith in God, he is a Christian with a strong faith in God, Tony Dungy spoke at his son's funeral service, and here was his advice to other parents in that service. Here's what he said. He said, hug your kids every chance you get. Tell them you love them every chance you get. Because you don't know when it's going to be the last time. Why? come before winter. Why go before winter? Because there's the danger of delay. There's the danger of delay. But there's a second question I have this morning. Did Timothy, did he come to Paul before winter? We can't answer that question from Scripture, but, but what if Timothy was like you or me? What if he knew he needed to go, but he waited for a more convenient time? Yes, I, I need to go to Rome, but first, there's some things that I need to attend to right here in Ephesus. Clarence McCartney in his sermon, Come Before Winter, he says this, hypothetically he says, and because Timothy delays, winter comes and he cannot get a ship until spring. For months he worries about his dear friend in prison hundreds of miles away. At last, better weather comes and Timothy makes the long journey to Rome. When he arrives, he tries to find Paul, but no one seems to know where he is. Finally, he comes to the home of Claudia or Pudens or Linus, names that are mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, and they recognize him. Hey, aren't you Timothy? Paul wanted to see. So badly he wanted to see you. He prayed that you would come. He, he never gave up hope of seeing you again before he died, but Timothy, he was beheaded last October. His last message to you was, give Timothy my love. Tell him goodbye for me. Tell him to meet me in heaven. Now, you or I or Clarence McCartney, we don't know if it happened like that or not, but I do know this. From the urgency of Paul's words, we ought to learn that danger of delay. And here's the second statement that I want you to write down. 
Second money statement. Procrastination destroys many good intentions. Think about that statement part. Procrastination destroys many good intentions. You know more marriages, more marriages die because of slow neglect than from deliberate desertion. I mean, we need, we, we know we need to say a word of encouragement. We, we know we need to express our love. We just never get around to it. Friend, could I challenge us all this morning? Write that letter. Make that call. Make amends with that loved one or that friend. Share the gospel with that neighbor. Parents, if you have children in your home, make sure you've presented the gospel to them. Make sure your family knows that you love them. But most of all, my friend, make sure that you're right with God. Don't make plans to pray more. Do it. Don't make plans to serve more. Do it. Don't make plans to start witnessing. Do it. Don't make plans to be more faithful. Do it. And we all, we've all got dreams. We've all got lofty goals. But if we're not careful, we will wake up one morning and we will find that because we put off today what we thought we could do tomorrow, we'll find that our marriage has grown cold. We'll wake up one day and realize that the children... They've left home. They're gone. We'll wake up one morning and realize because we put it off, we, we realize that our spiritual life has grown dull. Come before winter. Go now. Do it now. Serve God now. What you're going to do for God, do it now. The story is told of three apprentice demons who were coming to earth for their first assignment. They met their father Satan who asked them what strategy they planned to follow down here on this earth. And the first one said, I'll tell people that there is no God. Satan automatically said that will not work because people in their heart of hearts, they know there is a God. The second demon said, well, I'll tell them that there is no hell. And Satan said that will not work because there's so much evil on earth, they know there must be a hell. That third demon thought for a moment and he said, Father, I will tell them that there's no hurt. Satan said, Go. You convince them of that and it will ruin them by the millions. Why should we come before winter? Because there's danger in the land. Did Timothy go before winter? We can't answer that, but we know there was a great need to. Paul desired it. And then last of all, here's the personal part of it. Will we? Will we come? Will we go before winter? Look at it again in verse number 21. It's, it's, it, you'll miss it if you don't really look at it. Don't miss the first three words. Do thy diligence to come before winter. I, I want would I have gone? Would I have recognized the urgency in the words of the Apostle Paul? Most of us in here today in our heart, uh, we would say, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I believe I would have gone. Yes, I, I will go before winter. You know, there's a lot of us. Uh, I read this to the early crowd. I want to read it to you. It says, you lived next door to me for years. We shared our dreams, our joys, our tears. A friend to me, you were indeed a friend who helped me in my need. My faith in you was strong and sure. We had such trust as should endure. No spats between us ever arose. Our friends were like and so were our foes. What sadness then, my friend, to find that after all you weren't so kind the day my life on earth did end. I found you weren't a faithful friend for all those years we spent on earth. You never talked of second birth. You never spoke of my lost soul and of the Christ who could make me whole. I plead to Dale for... I plead today from hell's cruel fire and tell you now my last desire. You can't do a thing for me. No words today my bonds can free. But do not err, my friend, again. 
Do all you can for the souls of me. Plead with them now quite earnestly, lest they be cast in hell with me. Friend, I, th I think about some of the opportunities that I've had, and I can somewhat identify with that. I can somewhat live with that reality. Why didn't I go one more time? Why, why didn't I take the call them one more time or check in on them one more time? I had good intentions, but somehow, as a pastor, I never got around to doing it. Some things need to be said now. Some things need to be done now. The opportunity is today, not tomorrow. Could I ask you something this morning, my friend? What is God calling you to do today? And make no mistake, there are many here this morning, and you know God is calling you to do something. There is a man in here today. There is a woman in here today. There is a teenager in here today. And you know right now, in this moment, the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with you about being saved. You know He's dealing with you right now. Friend, don't put that off. Come today. What good deed. What act of forgiveness. What step of faith. What prayer should you pray. What sin should you confess. What bad habit must be broken. What service could you render for the Lord in this church. What class could you teach. What call must you make? What email must you write? What relationship must you try to repair? Who in your life needs to know Jesus? And you've been putting off telling me. Friend, whatever it is, come before one another. Do it now. Listen, if you intend to spend time with your children, They won't be at home forever. Question. What if you really did know that today was the last day of your life? Who would you call? What would you say? Who would you witness to? Who would you profess your love to today? Who would you forgive? And you know, whenever we ask a question like that, it always tends to be theoretical because deep inside, deep inside, most of us expect to live many more years. Many will sit in a service like this and hear the urgency of the pastor and the urgency of the Apostle Paul and saying, do what we need to do today. What if I did know today were my last day? And what we're thinking is, but I know it's not going to. I'm going to live several more years. Martin Luther said this. He said we should live every day with the day of our death placarded before our eyes. We should live every day with, with our death on a placard that we can see before our eyes. Leadership experts call that living with the end in view. I hope everyone in here this morning has a long, long, prosperous life. But I can't guarantee you. I can't guarantee me that, but I, 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 I can tell you this. Just one call can change your life. There are some in here this morning, and before you call anybody else, before you go to anybody else, you need to call on the Lord Jesus Christ before you call anybody else. You need to get serious about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you in here today, you say, you know what? I'm going to serve the Lord someday. Listen, if you're going to serve Him someday, then why not start today? I mean, what do you gain? What do we gain by putting Him off? How can you be certain? How can you even be certain that when tomorrow does come or someday does come, that that thought will even enter your mind that I am going to serve Him someday? That may never enter your mind again. If God is speaking to you today, answer that call. Because it may never come again. There comes a time when God shuts the door. If you don't believe that, you go home and you read the story of Noah. There came a day God shut the door. And all who were not in that ark perished. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. We would not do the scripture any harm. We know it was written to one of the seven churches in Asia, but here's what Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Jesus standing outside the door of the church. 
Jesus says something like this, Behold, look, listen, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will hear, if any man will open up the door and let me come in, I will enter. I'll have fellowship with him. I'll commune with him. I will save him, if you will. He stands this morning and he knocks at the door of your heart. Will you open the door and let him come in? He says, come unto me. Come now. Don't delay. Don't put it off. The Bible says, behold, today is the day of salvation. The sweetest word and the most solemn word of salvation is that little word today. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, come down out of that sycamore tree, Zacchaeus, for today I am going to your house. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Why does it say that, preacher? Because tomorrow may never come. Today is the day. Listen, if you can find one place, if you can find one place in this blessed book where it says, come to Christ tomorrow, if you can find any place in the Word of God where it says come to Christ tomorrow, then I will never stand up here again and preach with such urgency about coming to Jesus. About going to others and making eternal decisions. Are you living with the end in view? I told the early service about a preacher who was preaching a meeting in a little town. Preaching a revival service. On the last night, he'd been pleading with people to come to Christ all week long. And on the last night, he preached a sermon. And his thought, his theme around that sermon was don't take a chance. He said that evening there were a group of teenagers who were sitting in the back. Four or five teenagers, they were sitting in the back in the corner. And as he was preaching on don't, don't take a chance, they were laughing. And, and uh, they were passing notes and, and uh, mocking him. Uh, saying, don't take a chance. You know, just, just mocking him. Well, after that service, and you know how the story goes, after that service, these teenagers got into a car to go to the hangout place where the local teachers, uh, uh, teenagers hung out. And sure enough, on their way there, they were in a car accident. Every teenager lived in that accident, except, or every teenager died in that accident, except one little young girl, one teenage girl. The preacher... And this evangelist, they were uh, going to have dinner after the service or, or he was going back to his hotel. But they passed this accident, saw the ambulance, saw the, the uh, first responders, the EMS, all that. They saw that and the preacher recognized the car as one of those that the teenagers drove in his church. And so they jumped out and they told the policeman and, and the, the ambulance, the EMS, said, hey, we're preachers, what can we do? And they noticed that girl, the only one living, lay there on the side of the road. They could hear her saying something. Here's what she was saying. Drawing her last breath. Don't take a chance. Don't take a chance. Don't take a chance. Don't take a chance. She just kept repeating that over and over and over. My friend, everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. Don't take a chance with your soul. Don't take a chance. If you're in here today, you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, don't put it off. There's a danger in delay. If you're in here today, there's somebody you need to go to and tell them you love them. There's somebody you need to go to and try to repair a relationship. There's some kid, your kids, your grandchildren. Go to them today and hug them. Tell them you love them. Somebody that doesn't know Jesus Christ, go to them and share the gospel with them. Don't take a chance that tomorrow will ever come. Living with the end in view. I want you to listen to me. Invitation is very important. I don't want anybody moving. I don't want nobody leaving. Christians, you ought to be praying about what God has said to you. And you ought to be praying about that 
one that needs to come to Jesus this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Before they begin to play, I want to ask you something. Very sobering question. Could I ask you? If you were to die today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven and spend an eternity with Jesus Christ? Do you know for sure? Friend, don't take a chance. If you've never been saved, I want you to come in a moment. If you have any doubt this morning, I want you to come in a moment. Let us lead you to faith in Christ. If you were to stand before Him right now and He were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? What would you say? say, Pastor, I don't know what I would say. Friend, come today. In just a moment, come. And give your heart to Christ. Nail that down. Don't take a chance. Others of you in here today, there's been a time in your life when you've received Christ as Savior. But what is it that you need to do today? Where is it that you need to go before winter comes? When you won't be able to go. Who do you need to go to? Who do you need to witness to? Who do you need to pray for? Who do you need to try and repair a broken relationship with? Who do you need to forgive this morning? I'd hate to know that I was holding a grudge, I was harboring resentment, hatred and strife, against somebody and I knew I knew the Holy Spirit had been dealing with me about it I knew the Holy Spirit had been dealing with me about it for, for years and years I just, not, I just wouldn't turn it over to Him and make it right I would hate to know I would hate to know knowing that the Holy Spirit had been dealing with me about that but I never made it right and that person dropped dead don't Some of you in here today, listen, you know God is calling you. He's leading you to join Blue Ridge View Baptist Church, to be a part of a local church right here on this hill, helping us reach people for Jesus Christ. Friend, don't delay. Do it now. Do it today. Whatever the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with you, some of you just need to come Pray this morning. Pray for that one that needs Christ. Some of you need to come and pray for that burden, that care. You need to come today and get on this altar and ask God for strength to do some of these things that we've talked about before it's too late. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, I just pray right now in this invitation. We've been clear. We've been plain. Lord, I pray that every single one of us, starting in the pulpit, down to the pew, I pray that every single one of us, Lord, would answer the call that you're placing on our hearts right now. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Would you stand right where you are? Every head bowed, every eye.